When watching 2001 A Space Odyssey, there are many scenes which stick to mind in this masterpiece of a movie, especially the weird ones. Someone in the production team might occasionally have taken drugs. This is grass. You mean marijuana? However, the scenes which I found most interesting were the ones when Dr. Haywood Floyd approaches the moon and we see the whole journey from the giant rotating Earth orbiting station, the transit to the moon and the subsequent landing. We see Clavius moon base for the first time, a pretty impressive and large base on the moon which seems to be occupied by many people. And I was asking myself, Will we have a moon base by the year 2001? And will I be able to travel there? But instead of moon base, we had to see some very, very bad stuff happen in 2001. No, I meant the other bad stuff. Okay, so where was I? Oh, yes, right, moon bases. So, 2001 and no moon bases. None whatsoever. Nothing. Niente, nada. And I was asking myself, how could they be so optimistic back in 1968 and think that we have this giant moon base in 2001? Was the vision of the year 2001 absolutely exaggerated? Or could we really have had a moon base like this already 17 years ago? And if yes, what the hell went wrong? Well, to find out what went wrong, we have to travel back in time and take a look at that era, the 60s, the era of the space race. It was an era where the Soviet Union and the US were battling each other by achieving more and more astounding feats in space. The US was lagging behind the Soviet Union since 1957. But then, during the Apollo era, the US gained the upper hand. Everything was looking good. The first lunar round trip was performed in 1968 with Apollo 8, sending back the famous Earthrise picture. Then, the first manned lunar landing in 1969, one amazing feat after another. Several other manned landings followed afterwards, Apollo 12, 14, 15 and 16. Until 1972, the last man on the moon, Eugene Cernan, left the moon with Apollo 17. No one has been back since then. Why? Well, for that we have to analyze the plans NASA had with the Apollo program. Were they to be one-time journeys, one-time endeavors? Well, it turns out there were plans for moon bases even as far back as the 50s, even before NASA was established in 1958. This video will detail NASA's moon base concept, but there were many others. We'll give you a quick overview over all the different moon base concepts that were floating around during that time. So let's take a look at the timeline published by NASA already in 1966. Now there were three phases in this endeavor to create a permanent outpost on the moon. From this NASA timeline, dating as far back as 1966, we see that from the beginning Apollo was planned as a first stepping stone towards a lunar outpost. The stay time would have been gradually increased from two days to two years, while the cost would have been significantly reduced during that time. Also, the personnel would have increased from 2 to 12 astronauts, while a semi-permanent outpost would have been achieved by 1980. The stages were Apollo as flown, 
then the Apollo Exploration Systems AES, the Apollo Logistics Support Systems ALSS, and then the Lunar Exploration Systems for Apollo LESA. And this is the LSA, LSLA ATL. Excuse me? Yes, what is it? Uh, what was that again with the LSA LPTSA? For the half this time! The LSA LPTSA, not to be confused with the PSA LPTSA, decouples from the LSA LSLA ATL, finally becoming the LPL LSLL ATAL. Get it? <laughs> y yes. Apollo 15 to 17 has flown was our first step. The lunar lander included the lunar rover, an open rover vehicle which had a range of 92 km and a power output of 180 watts. It allowed to drastically increase the exploration range for the respective mission. See for example Apollo 17 in Taurus Litro Valley, where the RV was essential to explore very different geological formations that lie quite far away from each other. 32 km were driven on Apollo 17. Now, let's start with the easiest concept for lunar base. The Goosier State Time Extension Module as part of the AES first stage. The Staytime extension module would have been packed to the side of the lunar module in the same way as the lunar rover was packed during the Apollo missions 15 to 17. Since the weight of the stem was a function of Staytime and number of men, the lightest stems would have started at around 1000 pounds enabling a stay time of 6 days for 2 men. A standard stem would have enabled a stay time of 14 days for 2 men weighing around 1500 pounds. Higher capacity stems would have required two Saturn V launches, one unmanned lunar module delivering the stem and then afterwards the second one delivering the astronauts. Prototypes were already constructed with different shapes and sizes. The larger ones of course enabling a longer stay time with a maximum of 30 days for 6 astronauts. This here was the prototype of the two-man stem for a 14-day stay time. The deployment process would have been quite straightforward. The stem packed to the lunar module would have been unpacked, then inflated with oxygen using a pump, which all of course would have to be brought along as well. Then the life support systems, consisting of water and oxygen, would have been attached to the stem plus the communications array. Afterwards, the equipment would have been carried into the stem and voila, the first small base on the moon would have been ready, allowing for a drastic increase of stay time on the moon as compared to the standard Apollo missions. The AES second stage would have required new hardware. The payload capacity would have been extended to at least 2,500 pounds. A LEM jet was proposed, which is a modified lunar lander which allows longer stay. The second phase in the evolution towards a permanent lunar base would have been the ALSS, which would have extended the payload capacity to 7,500 pounds. A larger lunar module serving as a quite large base station would have been deployed in a Saturn V launch delivering only the base station without astronauts. In a second launch with a modified Saturn V, the astronauts would have landed in a standard or slightly modified lunar module. This setup would have allowed a stay of 30 days for three astronauts. Optionally, a pressurized rover was planned as well, called the MoLab, because it basically acted as a mobile laboratory or mobile base station and would have been able to travel hundreds of kilometers on the surface of the moon. Now we finally get to the last stage, the LESA moon base. This would have been it, the granddaddy, the end goal. Now LESA would have had four stages. The first stage would deliver a payload of around 10 tons to the surface of the moon and consist of a very large lunar shelter which would serve as the home base. It would allow a stay time of three men for up to 90 days. The second stage would additionally deploy a MOLAB pressurized rover which would be neatly fitted on top of the shelter as can be seen in this schematic drawing. To deliver these larger payloads to the moon, an upgrade of the Saturn V rocket would have been necessary, enabling a translunar payload capacity of around 85 tons. The third stage would yield stay times of 6 months for 6 astronauts and deliver 23 tons of payload to the moon. At least 8 Saturn V launches would have been necessary for stage 3 alone. The ultimate goal, however, was stage 4. This would have yielded a total of 2 years of stay time for 18 people. 
That is insane! By rotating the crew, a permanent presence on the moon would have been achieved. This would have needed 18 Saturn V launches per year. That is one Saturn V launch roughly every three weeks. Now, the final laser stage would have had at least nine underground modules covered with moon dust, so-called regolith, to protect the astronauts from meteorite impacts and from solar radiation. A SNAP-8 thermoelectric generator would have been used to deliver 100 kilowatts of power. But of course, one base was not enough. I mean, one base, right? One moon base. <laughs> you, have, you have only one moon base. Four of these laser bases would have been built until 1988. Now, two moon bases were planned to be constructed at Grimaldi Crater, one at the South Pole and one at the center of the far side of the moon. With a staggering 63 Saturn V launches from 1971 to 1988. 63! And now! Coming back to the beginning of this video, we finally might understand why the movie 2001 painted such an optimistic picture of the year 2001. It is absolutely not hard to imagine that, had humanity built the four laser moon bases by 1988, that 13 years later, in the year 2001, we could have had this giant lunar outpost at Clavius Crater, and a trip to the moon would have been indeed commonplace even 17 years ago. And now to the final question, why didn't it happen? Why? Why? They were so near to creating a permanent presence on the moon. How the hell could they mess it up? How the hell could they mess it up? How can someone be so stupid? You go to the moon, you go to the moon, you build a base on the moon, and then you decide not to go there anymore. What, what the fuck? It's like Christopher Columbus colonizing America, going to America, and never returning again. I mean, what the hell is wrong? What the hell? Honestly, they went to the moon, they, they, they had this chance, this chance to set up a permanent base. To understand why the moon bases have never happened, we have to take a look at NASA's annual budget. As you can see, it peaked in 1965 and 1966 at around 4.3 and 4.4% respectively of the total annual budget of the US. Crypto pump and dump anyone? Already in 1967 it was cut back and unfortunately in 1968 even more by the Johnson administration. Johnson? Yes? You are an <laughs> In December 1966, there were 13 Saturn V flights planned for the Apollo Applications Program. Half a year later, in May 1967, one flight got cancelled. Later on, within the same year, in October, only half of the original planned flights still remain in the program. Finally, in June 1968, all post-Apollo lunar launches got unfortunately cancelled. And that's why it's so important that we establish a permanent outpost on the moon. Starting with Apollo. Uh, excuse me, hey, sir, I have a question. Uh, it's all going well with your rocket thing, you know? It's super nice and so on, but can it fight the commies? Uh, excuse me? What? The commies. Can it fight the commies? The reds, you know? Down in them? Can it fight them? You know? Uh, the rocket is like, built like, to fly to the moon. Like, now to fight the commies. Now! Now to fight the commies, for sure. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, thanks, lady. Thanks, yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Must tell president. Rocket thingy does not attack commies. The Vietnam War had been raging since 1955 already, but now President Johnson intensified the military offensive, because from the American point of view, the spread of communism had to be fought at all costs. Johnson's famous words, the battle against communism must be joined with strength and determination. On 8th of March 1965, 3,500 US Marines were dispatched to South Vietnam, which marked the beginning of the ground war. By December 1965, a total of 200,000 American ground troops 
had been deployed in South Vietnam. As we all know now, the next years proved to be very costly for the US forces. 30,000 Americans had been killed by 1968, which basically destroyed Johnson's presidency as his approval rating dropped. The next president, Nixon, didn't fare better and had no choice than to start the withdrawal of US troops. The result? Not only had 58,000 American soldiers been killed, but the US had spent a staggering 1,054 billion, that is 1.054 trillion US dollars inflation adjusted to 2018 dollars on this war. The total cost of the Apollo program was only 116 billion 2018 dollars, only 11% of the Vietnam War. One could only imagine what would have been achieved if the money for that senseless and brutal war had flown into the Apollo applications program instead and thus the LASA moon bases. All further production of any Saturn V rockets, as well as the NASA moon base plans, were scrapped in 1968 by the Lyndon B. Johnson administration. That was basically the death of the LASA moon bases before they even began, even before the first man landed on the moon. But okay, the budget was due at around 2.3% in 1969. As you may think, there was still hope for the other moon base concepts. Unfortunately, shortly after that, the next warmonger, Nixon, became president, who cut back NASA's budget even more. Why Nixon? <laughs> In 1970, Apollo 20 had to be scrapped because of that, as NASA's budget was further cut back in 1971 and 1972, not only had all plans for a manned lunar outpost been absolutely destroyed, but also the remaining Apollo 18 and 19 flights had to be cancelled as well. You didn't think that was the end, did you? Fortunately, our boy Elon and his amazing company, SpaceX, are working on the ITIs. I mean BFR and BFS. I mean spaceship and super heavy. You know what? I have the perfect name for the next iteration. Elon, listen to this. Smur S. Super Mega Interplanetary Rocket and Spaceship System. The spaceship Super Heavy system will be capable of directly landing on the moon and of course also on Mars, for that is Elon's long-term goal. The first flight around the moon with the SpaceX system is scheduled for 2023 as of today. And we are very confident that by the late 2020s we will finally have our moon bases. The moon bases we should have had since the 70s and 80s will finally arrive. We hope you liked this video, leave us a comment in the comment section if you agree with us and also if you disagree that this timeline sucks, shitty timeline, because we should have had moon bases since the 70s at least, but as we saw, the future looks pretty bright. We would be very happy if you would subscribe, of course we won't force you. No, not us, mm -mm, not us, <laughs> never. Do it, do it, do it. Stay tuned because we will keep coming with further interesting topics bordering between sci-fi and sci-fi.